The creek runs three and a half miles along the border of Brooklyn and Queens, passing warehouses and a few factories and 12 hazardous way sites before merging with the East River, not far from the Empire State Building. And there are no signs to tell you that this is Newtown Creek, or that battleships were built here in World War II and the Civil War, or that kerosene and refined oil were invented here, or that ship traffic on this creek once rivaled that of the Mississippi, thanks to the oil industry that dominated these banks at the end of the 19th century. Also thanks to the oil industry, this water's got the lowest environmental rating from both New York City and state, and the soil's not great either. Thirty years ago, nervous city officials built a giant concrete wall blocking off part of the shoreline. They worried that one tossed cigarette might cause the ground to explode. Engineers estimated the resulting fire would be equivalent to the blast of a small nuclear bomb. Newtown Creek never did have good luck in neighbors. Places like Whistler's Dead Animal Wharf and Coe's Bone Boiling Factory processed all the dead horses in the city, which were boiled into glue or chopped into fertilizer. The fumes were so strong they blistered paint off houses. Imagine what it was like to breathe. Today the water seems abandoned. The only sound a pile driver in the distance building yet another waste treatment plant in a neighborhood that's become trash central for New York City. And with me in the canoe is environmentalist Basil Sagos, leading the first organized effort to save what he calls the most polluted creek in America. Look how the boat is pushing the scum uh, along the surface. It's oil, it's sewage, it's a variety of chemicals. Basil's a lead investigator for the Riverkeeper, a citizen group that's been policing the Hudson River for three decades. Their primary weapon is still the 1973 Clean Water Act, prohibiting unlicensed dumping. Like this hidden pipe we discover spilling liquid cement into the creek. This is great. Look at all the suds right here. Liquid cement right there. The pipe was concealed behind a rock pile, only visible up close and at low tide. You know, it's a green pipe, plastic. It looks like some sort of a heavy plastic pipe. They just threw it in themselves, yeah. If we're able to prove that these guys were knowingly discharging this stuff, it's pretty severe jail time. Good laws are on the books, but enforcing them against polluters hasn't always been easy. Take Exxon, who spilled 17 million gallons of oil here in the 1950s. That's twice as large a spill as the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. The Alaska spill took three years to settle. This one took 40. And even then, Basil says the two spills were punished very differently. The consent order in this called for no penalties, no specific benchmarks for cleanup, and no specific time frame for cleanup. And the Exxon spill in Alaska has already cost the company $5 billion in cleanup and in penalties. So you're talking about Prince William Sound versus, you know, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which, you know, Greenpoint, Brooklyn has no connection to its waterway, and it's largely a minority community that's just been literally dumped on for 150 years. It's not just corporations doing the dumping. The city, too, is to blame allowing tons of raw sewage to overflow into the creek each year. The problems have been ignored for so long, even Basil only discovered the creek two years ago. I've been in New York for six years, and I, I didn't know Newtown Creek was there. I mean, I'd, I'd walked over it a couple times. So you would walk over it, but what would you think you were walking over? Well, I, I mean, to be honest, I was running over it with, uh, with the New York Marathon, so I was thinking more about, like, the pains in my knees than, than the creek itself found the creek and, and went up it for the first time, I mean, it was like stepping back in time um, into, into an era where, where there were no environmental laws. I mean, every 30 yards, there's a new pollution problem, and there's nowhere else, anywhere in New York City or anywhere in the Hudson Valley, that has you know, this level of pollution at this scale. So how does water become invisible? A lot has to do with access, or lack of it. There's only one place you can visit Newtown Creek, a makeshift dock on the Brooklyn shore, and even that little bit of access makes a big difference. Here you get a whole new perspective on the water. Yeah, it's gorgeous. That's homicide detective Larry Eggers. A couple of bodies float up every spring in Newtown Creek, but Eggers isn't here for work. He's here for therapy. This is poor man's therapy. The creek of uh, Greenpoint here. 
Greenpoint Creek, I guess. I don't know what they call it. But nice. New, new Town. New Town Creek. Oh, New Town Creek? Okay. Cool. I love it. He's not the only one. Anthony Francis runs a boat building and ecology workshop for high school students, known as the East River Apprentice Shop. His students build boats and row them on the creek, and he says none of them have ever gotten sick, though they do a whole lot of hand washing. But Anthony's the kind of optimist who sees even the pollution as a learning opportunity. As contradictory as it sounds, there's something appealing about the fact that it wasn't, not that such a thing exists in New York City, but it wasn't a perfectly clean and idyllic setting. I visited Anthony's workshop inside a former jute factory on the creek's banks. On the CD player, a student's punk band plays. Many of the teens in this program come from so-called second chance high schools, but they might be this creek's best chance of a new future. I looked at it and I was disgusted. Ninth grader Teresa Ramos spent all summer rowing on the creek. She shows me a map that she and the other students made. She keeps it with her everywhere she goes. After all, how often does a 13-year-old get to chart a waterway that so few of us have explored? That's Brooklyn, that's Newtown Creek, and that's Queens. Newtown Creek is the border between Queens and Brooklyn. This is my actual words. On the way back, we saw bits of seaweed covered in oil. I wrote that. It's hard to know whether this map is a guide for activists or for tourists. One section features cancer warnings and a list of toxins. The next, a guide to wildlife they've discovered, like crabs, jellyfish, shrimp, even a seahorse. Believe it or not, we caught a seahorse in Newtown Creek. It was like half dead, but we caught a seahorse. Anthony says he doesn't want to spoil that, but there are times he wishes he could show them what real nature looks like. When I go to places like Newtown Creek, I always think to myself, boy, I sure wish I could show these kids that rainforest in Costa Rica that I've been to, or the Everglades, or, or the, the, the Appalachian Mountains around the Blue Ridge, or something like that. And, and, but every now and then, when I see these kids' reaction to the solitary black-capped heron, or, or the two-grass shrimp that we pull out of the, the, the cage, I realize that it's all relative they can still enjoy nature, even if it's in two little shrimp, to the same degree that I enjoyed three days of solitude on the Blue Ridge Mountains or some or someplace like that. So I'm careful not to tell them what they're missing, which, which is tough because you have to say what this place could be like if it were kept better, but I don't want them to feel like, as it is, it's not worthy and it's not beautiful in its own way. So what will be the future of Newtown Creek? Well, even as I was writing this story, Creek advocates had achieved small victories. The liquid cement polluters agreed to stop. All that took was basil and a canoe. But larger reforms will take more serious political muscle. That's why some advocates are looking towards the Olympics. It's a long shot now, but if the Olympics do come to New York in 2012, the Olympic Village will be built right nearby the creek. They hope to use that to call national attention to the problem and show New Yorkers that no water is truly invisible, and every place is somebody's backyard. <laughs>